Now, my name is Arik. I work at Spiral, and uh, most recently I've been working on adding support for taproot channels. At least I try to work on that on getting pulled back into Swift bindings. And uh, this presentation is supposed to be about um, why the taproot spec is laid out the way it is, and you know, what are some of the motivations, the constraints, limitations that are driving the design. And uh, I want to really dig deep into uh, the math that uh, you know some of the vulnerabilities that we're trying to avoid, as well as uh, you know how we're solving those issues. So, first of all. Now, obviously, we know that Taproot has not been active for a while, but why are we actually bothering with modifying the way that lightning channels are opened such that we can have lightning channels operate on, on Taproot? I guess I should have asked this question before showing this slide, but uh, let me just go back and see if the audience has any, any suggestions they want to volunteer. So their privacy. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so the biggest reason, of course, is that we have privacy improvements. Um, at least, you know, assuming that eventually everybody is going to be using uh, pay to taproot addresses. Uh, as you know, taproot is SegWit v1. SegWit was SegWit v0. This is our new software mechanism. If at some point we decide that we need SegWit v2, then all of the old Lightning Taproot channels that aren't even supported yet that are going to be using uh, SegWit v1 are going to lose their privacy status and they're going to once again start sticking out like a sore thumb. So that is one of the benefits. We are also able to improve privacy uh, by decorrelating payments. That is uh, PTLCs. And that is a privacy benefit that is actually going to persist even if we have a SegWit v2 or v3, because there the primary issue that we have with HDLCs right now is uh, that if we were to have multiple channels that have the same in-flight HDLC go on chain, then that hash would be correlatable and we would be able to link the payment chain, you know, and link one channel to the other. Uh, there are hopefully also some security improvements, such as threshold signatures, but it's still very much a uh, research phase. So, you know, mostly I think the greatest benefit really is privacy. Uh, there is also something to be said about the fact that um, with the way that Taproot works and the way that Lightning requires a bunch of different spend paths, with Taproot uh, cap trees, we are able to make a bunch of those spent paths much cheaper, and we are also able to not reveal the ones that are being unused. So it's also a, a bit of a cost reduction there, which will save us some fees. But first of all, why do we have better privacy? The primary reason that we have better privacy is because right now, Lightning channels on chain have a signature of a two of two multi-sig. The big improvement, or one of the two big improvements that Taproot brings is Schnorr signatures. And the cool thing about Schnorr signatures is that they allow us to have quite trivial N of N signatures that still look like they're single sig. So nobody monitoring the chain would know that a channel open is actually a channel open because it would be theoretically indistinguishable from just a regular transaction to a a single key. And uh, I hope that you all remember how Schnorr signatures look. You know, we see we have this big integer called S, and we have a public key point called R. We commit to our pub key. So here in this slide, the example is Alice. So her public key is uppercase A, her private key is lowercase A. And Alice's signature is a commitment to the nonce that she used, her pub key, and the message. In order to make sure that the signature doesn't leak her private key, we tweak the hash of uh, you know, her commitment with the message multiplied with her private key by a little random value called R. And we tweak that because if we weren't to tweak that, then somebody would trivially be able to apply the modular multiplicative inverse to lowercase s here and extract Alice's private key, which uh, of course we seek to avoid. But even doing everything correctly here, uh, there are some risks with opening 
you know, with, with creating two of two signatures, for example. One of those risks is naive key aggregation. Uh, the other one that I'm going to talk about later is nonce reuse, but what do I mean by naive key aggregation? So let's say that we have Alice and Bob who are trying to open a channel between those, uh, the two of them. And specifically, they're trying to figure out what their shared public key is going to be. Obviously, somebody has got to start in that protocol. So let's say that Alice initiates the conversation and she sends her public key to Bob. And then Bob is supposed to send his public key to Alice. And the sum of those two public keys is going to be the public key that's going to be the shared public key for the store signature. Well, Bob can quite trivially do an attack where, having received Alice's public key first, he first generates his own public key, but then, instead of uh, sending his random public key back to Alice, he subtracts Alice's public key. And then, as a result, we have that the sum of the two public keys that they calculate is one that completely eliminates Alice's, so it ends up that Bob has the capability to unilaterally create a signature. And of course, you do not want lightning channels where one of the parties is able to just unilaterally close it and unilaterally update the state without the other parties buying. So that is one of the issues that uh, require some solution. Um, another issue, of course, is nonce reuse. So here I have a quite simple equation where we have two separate signatures for different messages, m prime and m prime prime, but we're using the same nonce. As you can tell, lowercase r, which is the random number, and uppercase r, which is the same random number multiplied to the generator point, are equivalent. So what does the attack look like? Well, first of all, we can subtract one signature from the other, and then we see that we simply, so the R's cancel one, um, they cancel each other out, and we end up with an equation that is just uh, the private key multiplied with this expression that we can actually quite trivially calculate ourselves because we know the public key, we know the public nonce point, and we also know both messages. So knowing those, we apply the modular multiplicative inverse, and we have just solved for x, which is the private key. So not great, and really highlights how trivial it is to attack and to extract a private key if you have two signatures that have reused the same nonce. It's really, like, I wish this equation were written out more frequently because I think people understate quite how trivial of an attack this is. I mean, you, you can write the Python code in like two minutes. Yes, That's Cody. how Sony got pawns. They were reusing nonces on all of their ECDSA signatures. It was the same signature, it was the same nonce for all the signatures for all the PlayStations. Yeah, so. that, that is true. I believe it was the PlayStation 3, right? Um, although for ECDSA signature, so the thing about Schnorr is the math is so simple, it's just addition and multiplication. You don't have any of the ECDSA complications. So here you you don't even have to think that long about why this attack is trivial. However, obviously we need to mitigate these attacks. So MUSIC2 comes to the rescue. I'm sure all of you have heard about MUSIC2 many times. And essentially the main thing that MUSIC2 does, it's like the same approach that eliminates the attack vector for both the naive key aggregation and the nonce reduce is it introduces coefficients, and those coefficients are deterministic. They are based on just hashing some of the data, and each participant hashes slightly different data, and that results in uh, not being able to execute such targeted attacks, because if you were to try to execute an attack where you, know, you feed Alice and, uh, an adversarial pub key, that would actually completely modify all the coefficients, and then you would be back to square one. So that's what music does. And specifically, you know, let's let's dig into the math because it's it's actually not too complicated, at least with the key side here. The way music works is um, we have these coefficients that are applied to each public key. So maybe if we start, if we work our way from the bottom up. All right, so if you see at the end, 
the resulting public key that we end up with is ultimately just the first public key multiplied with a coefficient and the second public key multiplied with a, co with a different coefficient, so the coefficient being C1 and C2. So really the interesting aspect here is how are these coefficients calculated? So one of the things that is important is that the coefficients are calculated by hashing something and one component of the hash is um, all the public keys that all the participants are using, which means that in order for the hashes to work out, we need to know a priori what order those public keys are going to be used in. So in Lightning, what we do is we simply sort the public keys lexicographically, like, or you know, based on their bytes. Uh, but if you have some other sorting algorithm, or you just know the order and it's not sorted, but it just ordered beforehand, that also works. The important thing is just that you know which public key corresponds to which coefficient. And then, you know, say if you're Alice and your public key also comes first, so your index is one, because in math, indices don't start at zero. If Alice's index is one, then she simply takes her own public key, concatenates it with a hash of the sequence of all the public keys, which, you know, in this case would be first hers, then Bob's, uh, that thing is hashed, and that hash is concatenated with her own pub key, then we hash that again, and so, uh, you know, because in elliptic curve photography, we can simply interpret hashes as big integers, you know, we take that hash, we take that hash, and simply use that as a big integer that is the coefficient for her public key. Now, if you have been reading the music 2 protocol, then you will know that this is not actually true because we have an exception for the second index. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, I, I, I think for understanding, you know, what really, what problem music solves and how it does that, this is kind of uh, deep enough. So I hope I haven't confused anybody yet. All right, because uh, next is non-segregation. And with nonsys, we really do the same thing. And you know, one might actually wonder why, you know, if we're already doing this stuff with keys, do we even have to bother with uh, non-segregation and adding coefficients to our nonces? And actually, this is probably a good point where I should call the audience. Any, any guesses as to why we care about nonce coefficients also? Yeah? You can fool people into non-series. Uh, you could fool people into non-series, yeah, that, that is one thing. And um, you could also construct a nonce adversarially in such a way that you would then be able to unilaterally create a signature uh, with music too. So it's it's really pretty much the same thing. And with nonces, you know, the protocol is a little more complicated, but I really still want to go through it because one of the innovations with music too is how this protocol can work uh, with just one round trip, as opposed to multiple round trips that we had with regular music. So the way this works is as follows. Each participant generates not one lowercase r that we had here, uh, yeah, but they generate two. So a music two nonce is actually not one nonce, but it is two nonces, and let me get back here. So then both of these nonces are then sent to the other participants, and uh, what then happens is that we calculate a hash that we then use as a coefficient, and that coefficient is applied only to the second nonce. So what happens is that we have one of the nonces being used at least once, and the other one being used, you know, some, you know, a deterministic number of times. But we have this linear combination which guarantees that uh, we cannot really adversarially target either one of those nonces. Specifically, how the coefficient is calculated is uh, you know, not super complicated, because what we do is we add all the nonces with index 1 across all the participants, that is going to be our aggregate first nonce, and we add all of the nonces with index 2, also from all the participants. And uh, then we, we apply the, uh, the coefficient just to the second one of the two. 
So we have these aggregate partial masses, and uh, you know, we add them up, we have a linear combination that is the same as doing the same linear combination individually, uh, but it just makes our uh, mathematics a little simpler because we, we don't have to repeat addition. We, we have that automatically from the addition that happened beforehand. And uh, the coefficient we're using is actually the sum of the uh, nonces with index 1, the sum of the nonces with index 2, the aggregate public key that we have already determined in the prior step, which we only need to do once, and the message that we want to assign. So then, really, it's just a matter of aggregating all of those partial signatures with those nonces. But uh, yeah, really, the interesting trick, the, the cool innovation with music too, is the fact that each participant sends two nonces at once, and uh, that we you know, then aggregate the nonces by their index across all the participants. However, even in music two, you would think, all right, now we, we have this thing where we are calculating coefficient, so really music two is guaranteeing that there should be no nonce reuse. Well, what happens if one of the participants were to reuse the original nonce or their original nonce pair across multiple partial signatures. So here I have simplified the equation a little bit because really what we would get is uh, you know, this, this expression at first, the hash multiplied with a private key, plus in principle it ought to be uh, uh, C prime which uh, times Ra and then plus Rb because we have those two. But really for the purposes of uh, uh, mathematical simplification, we're going to ignore the one that doesn't have a coefficient because I think the coefficient one is more interesting. And uh, this, I'm pretty sure everybody can tell, is a very simple linear equation system. So what we do is we simply multiply each one of these equations with the coefficient from the other one, and then we can simplify the equation and we can extract x. Yeah, we, we can extract the private key. You know, we, we, if I hadn't simplified this, if I had also included the other uh, partial nonce, then we simply would have done this elimination step twice because, you know, we're trying to eliminate multiple variables, but we, we have uh, sufficient equations to, to do so. so. So why do we even care about this? That is because we don't really trust our counterparty because of our in a multi-sig setup, we don't really worry about the rest of the world attacking us and knowing what we, you know, knowing what our private key is. We also really want to make sure that each one of the participants in a in a multi-signature cannot know what the other participant's private key is either, because as soon as they do, we have lost the whole benefit of uh, having a multi-sig setup. So. Now that we know that these are the steps that we need to do in order to avoid the pitfalls with Schnorr, we need to use music too. How then do we transfer it to actually creating and signing, signing lightning commitments? And before we'll dig into that, we need to first consider what the properties of lightning commitments are. First of all, without sig hash any out or covenants or anything of the sort, we are going to have to rely on asymmetrical commitment transactions, which means that when Alice and Bob open a channel with one another, their commitment transactions are not going to look identical because uh, we have the read remedy branch and the to self delay is going to apply to different outputs depending on whether you're looking at the commitment transaction from Alice's or from Bob's perspective. So right out of the gate, we already have two different messages that we need to sign. Second, we have the same aggregate key. Because our aggregate key is our funding key and it doesn't change across each new commitment, it means that we have to be extremely careful not to reuse nonces. And because we have to sign multiple commitments, it really means that we have to have two nonce pairs as opposed to one nonce pair that we send out with each exchange. So let's look at how it would work in practice with, say, a channel opening. So what we want to get to is we want Alice 
to have a signed commitment transaction with Bob's private key, such that she can later append her own partial signature where she uh, in a need to broadcast unilaterally. And we need the same for Bob too. So if Alice opens a channel to Bob, then of course what she needs is eventually for Bob to provide, provide her with a partial signature. In order for Bob to be able to do that, Alice, right out of the gate, needs to send Bob her local nonce. And that local nonce, which is the public nonce there, is the one that uh, Bob is going to need in his partial signature because the commitment incorporates an aggregation of those nonces. So Bob, in order to be able to calculate the music two step, needs to know what Alice's local nonce later down the line is going to be. So, you know, if we just follow the flow, Alice sends Bob her local nonce, as well as a remote nonce such, as, such that Bob can create a partial signature for himself. You know, we then have Bob respond with the same step where Bob generates the nonce pairs and uh, sends those in the accept channel message. And then in funding created, Alice can now provide a partial signature to Bob because what Bob needs is uh, a partial signature that uses Alice's remote nonce because the commitment transaction that Bob has from his perspective, it is his local, and from Alice's perspective, it's Alice's remote. So we have on Bob's side, Alice's remote nonce and Bob's local nonce, and on Alice's side, we have Alice's local and Bob's remote. It's, it is impossible to keep track of, and uh, as a matter of fact, reading the spec and trying to implement it, it's really messed with my mind. So that is why we have uh, been proposing a little simplification of the protocol, where we don't send the nonces until they're actually strictly necessary. And the way it works is, when Alice opens the channel, she needn't bother, in theory, sending any nonces whatsoever, because she doesn't even know whether Bob's going to accept the channel yet. Right? So why generate any sort of cryptographic material if uh, you're never going to end up using it? So if Bob, however, does opt to open a channel with Alice and accept it, then he can generate a local nonce pair for, um, for himself. And he then sends his own local nonce, the, you know, the, which is still a pair, we have to remember that now even though it's called a nonce, it's still a, a nonce pair because of the whole music two thing. So he generates this local nonce pair and sends it to Alice. Now Alice knows what nonce of Bob's she needs to combine her remote one with. And uh, you know, she can just trivially create a partial signature. And the nice thing is that now, because she has pre-committed her remote nonce, she can generate that partial signature and the nonce all in one step. So she needn't ever store her own remote, remote nonce. In fact, she can just toss it out. She'll send it with funding created and never ever worry about it again. Uh, the other thing that she's going to send with the funding created message is also her own local nonce, such that Bob can later create a partial signature that is going to be signed with Bob's own remote nonce and Alice's local one. And in this scenario, once again, because Bob has not pre-committed to his own remote nonce, he can very trivially generate it randomly as he is doing the signature, and then as soon as he has a signature, he can toss it out because he will never ever need it again. With the channel operation, we have pretty much the same thing. You know, we have the uh, commitment sign and revoke and act messages where we do pretty much the, the same nonce exchanges. And so uh, we really, uh, when we send the commitment sign, we just need to send the remote nonce such that Bob can then use a partial signature and revoke an act, as well as, you know, and revoke an act, he will send one for it for the next step. Uh, he also the local nonce for the, the following iteration of the channel exchange. But um, really, there isn't much of a difference between channel opening and channel operation. Really, the most important thing is that uh, you have to have separate nonce pairs for your own local commitment transaction and for the remote commitment transaction. And it's something that can be a bit of a pain to keep track of. One thing I will note is 
If you think that your node setup is such that you will never ever possibly have to sign a local commitment transaction with your own private key multiple times, then in principle, you don't even need to update your own, um, your, your own local nonce because there would never be a nonce reuse. However, it is something that is very hard to guarantee, so for the purpose of safety, uh, please ignore I said that. <laughs> well, we have pretty much covered the thing that Taproot enables with uh, you know, the, the nonce communication, so you know, even though on-chain the footprint is smaller, with the nonces, we do have this additional headache that all of you who are implementing uh, Lightning protocols are going to have to be cognizant of. But that is not the only thing that Taproot does. Taproot also, as I have alluded to earlier, allows us to have tap trees where instead of having just one massive, dare I say, kind of inscrutable script, especially with all this up if, up else nest thing, we can very cleanly divide the spent paths into their separate tap branches. And one of them is just happens to be so trivial that we don't even need a, a, a script spend for it. We can just use the key, the key spend pan. So with a revocation pub key or with a revocation key, we can sign and spend a transaction lightning immediately. Because it's unencumbered by any sort of you know, check sequence verify, delays, whatever, that is the obvious candidate that is going to end up as the key spend pan. So in Taproot, the cheapest way to spend a commitment transaction is going to be using the revocation key. With the script spend pan, we, you know, for the regular local output that just has the self delay, we don't really need any other script spend pass other than the one that has this to self delay. There is some discussion, uh, there's some discussion as to whether we want to prepend uh, one or something to object sequence verify, but uh, you know, this is, uh, I don't think the discussion is quite done yet. Uh, the idea is that we're gonna feed uh, the scripts into a miniscript parsers and generators and then see what the optimal script output is. But uh, just reading this, people might be confused because they'll say, oh, if check sig passed, but uh, say to self delay is um, is zero. Will it go through? Uh, to self delay, obviously, should never be zero. But there's going to be a follow up case where there's going to be uh, a bigger question. So for HTLC offers, and I don't really want to go into accepted HTLCs because they're so similar to offered HTLCs. We still have the same situation that the uh, revocation key is the unencumbered spend path. And for that reason, it becomes the key spend. For script spend paths, we now have two situations. So one of them is uh, if we are able to provide the, the hash free image, which is uh, marked in green here. And the script looks a little complicated, but the point is, you know, once object sig verifies here, and then it should be one, and then we have object sequence verify. But if uh, object sig does not verify, then we have a zero, and then we have zero object sequence verify. And the question is, would it then mean that without a valid signature, uh, we would be able to spend it with, uh, without delay? Well, it doesn't, because OpCSV has some uh, weird consideration where a transaction can never actually be spent with a zero sequence because it's, uh, it's doing greater than and not greater equals. Uh, but uh, like just reading the script, nobody would know. So this is something where uh, you know, we, we are still kind of figuring out what the spec ought to look like and whether we want to optimize for uh, minimal cost or whether we want to optimize for uh, legibility. I guess that is kind of the perennial debate within Bitcoin script. Maybe, maybe uh, simplicity will make things simpler, one would hope. But uh, no idea. It's uh, it, it's still kind of up in the air, and I do hope that maybe some of you will also add some, your input to it on the on the spec discussion. So 
this, of course, is a situation where uh, you know we didn't, we weren't able to provide the pre-image in time, and so the original person that offered the HTLC uh, wants to spend it again because you know it never went through, and there, you know, we have quite trivial one-to-one -one matching of what the script looked like before taproot and what it's going to look like after taproot. So nothing really all the complicated to get dig into there. And um, yeah, I really think that uh, the script path spends are not the difficult part about taproot. It's really going to be understanding and making sure that the cryptography is sound and safe. Now, if you have a taproot channel open and there are some other nodes in the network, then in principle, what do you think? Are those other network uh, are those other nodes able to send a payment if they don't support Taproot through a channel somewhere in the middle of the route that is a Taproot channel, or should they not be? Should be. Able to. Should be able to. In fact, I mean, cryptographically speaking, there isn't really anything preventing them from being able to do so, right? Well, here's the thing about Taproot, though. The way that gossip works today, you have signatures that match on-chain outputs, and those on-chain outputs are signed using ECDSA. With taproot channels, that wouldn't work, because we now have Schnorr signatures, which means that even nodes that don't support taproot, in order to so much as be aware of the fact that there are taproot channels out there available for routing, they will need to understand taproot gossip before they even support what uh, you know, actual capture channels themselves. So this is one of the issues that is uh, that has been discussed. Now, L has a proposal up, which uh, says that um, for taproot gossip, you have the possibility of uh, combining and aggregating a signature across both the on-chain Bitcoin keys and the and the off-chain node public keys into one. So you, know, you reduce the footprint of the gossip signature by a considerable amount. It's just you, know, you have to actually do that aggregation. So it will add a little extra communication that is going to be necessary between nodes just as they are opening the channel. And you also need to make sure that nodes understand what this gossip is supposed to look like even before they necessarily support the taproot. So that is uh, unfortunately one of the one of the drawbacks of Taproot. But you know, by using a different signature algorithm and different on-chain footprint, you know, unless you have support for gossip from the very beginning, you know, you're going to have a part of the network otherwise unable and even unaware of the fact that there is a part of the network that is now based on Taproot. So just you know, going back to the beginning. So far, you know, we have talked about how, you know, in order to leverage the benefits of Schnorr for improved privacy, to mitigate the risks of Schnorr, we had to use music too for key aggregation and non-segregation, as well as, you know, now because we're using Taproot and therefore we need to use Tap scripts, we have to modify where you know where those individual spent paths are located, as well as what gossip looks like. So it's it's quite a dependency tree, and I hope it gave you a little bit of an overview of you know kind of what the what the constraints and design decisions and the uh, you know the sort of vulnerabilities are that are driving the spec and why it is the way it is. However, uh, there is some really cool stuff that happens enables that I also want to dig into, and that is PTLCs. And PTLCs are also going to be driven by a bunch of very similar considerations. So, um, you know, but before I move on to PLCs, I was wondering if anybody had any questions so far. Yes? Does the, um, does the fact that you have to sort of explicitly announce the average uh, channel the process, does that get rid of any of the privacy issues uh, or any of the uh, privacy benefits that you get on chain? Like, could you, for example, be like, oh, this is a link? Yeah, yeah. So, by if you're monitoring the gossip on Lightning, then you would know, you know, you would know that particular output 
on chain, of course, corresponds to uh, you know, corresponds to a lightning channel. And that is a privacy consideration that we're uh, that we're facing right now already. And that is why there is talk about gossip v2, which would essentially be only committing to a fraction of the money that you have put up. But that is its own can of worms. So um, honestly, I can strongly recommend watching Matt Corrales talk from CapConf last year, where he, uh, well, it was titled Lightning is Broken as Fuck. <laughs> and one of the major breakages is, uh, is privacy. Lightning has uh, atrocious privacy today. And even though with Taproot we improve on-chain privacy, if, uh, say, chain analysis, and therefore the IRS, uh, not of course that, you know, they're bad guys, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> if they were to monitor the Lightning Network, then they would also know what uh, outputs are uh, tampered out that's on-chain. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a big subject of research. Uh, I don't think there's consensus quite yet that gossip V2 is the way to move forward, although I think it's slowly building. We'll see. I, uh, I'm extremely curious to see how it's going to go, because uh, you know, it's uh, definitely cause for concern. Because as long as uh, you have these privacy considerations, you know, if you want to extend, as long as you have privacy considerations, you also have censorship considerations. Because uh, as long as anybody knows who payment initiators or recipients are, they can be censored. So it's, uh, I, I think it's a major issue for the uh, full kind of research and investigation on Lightning. But that being said, you know, another aspect where we can you know, somewhat improve privacy is PPLCs because of the issue that I mentioned earlier where uh, payments between hops could not be correlated. Even though, to be quite frank, today already the odds of multiple hop. All right. <laughs> Even today, the odds of multiple hops being correlated on chain are fairly low because you have to have multiple channels uh, go on chain with HDLCs in flight, which, I mean, let's be honest, is not a big risk. Uh, what this does help the with is wormhole attacks, for example, where somebody can see, you know, if somebody has multiple nodes that they're controlling and those nodes are talking to one another, and it just so happens that multiple of those nodes are involved and the same routed, um, routed payment, then they would know that uh, you know, they are involved in the same payment and they would be able to steal some money. With BTLCs, they wouldn't know because there is no correlation whatsoever. So how do BTLCs work precisely? Um, actually, who here already knows how BTLCs work? All right, cool. I'm really glad that I'm finally able to actually bring up something that people here are not as of yet familiar with. So let's say that Alice is trying to pay Emily, or more precisely, Emily is trying to get paid by Alice. I'm using this particular phrasing because Emily is the one that has to initiate the whole flow by, uh, by creating an invoice. Her invoice is no longer gonna be a hash. What Emily does is she generates some random number Z uh, some number of which is within the finite field that we're using for our elliptic curve. And she multiplies it with a generator point, as we always do, so essentially the public point corresponding to the private integer. And she sends uppercase Z to Alice. So that uppercase Z is now the invoice. So the invoice, instead of being a hash, is an elliptic curve point. What Alice does is um, the following. So Alice sees that there are a bunch of intermediate pumps namely Bob, Carol, and Dave. And Alice generates four random numbers, one for herself and one for each of the intermediate comps. Uh, you know, those random numbers are A, B, C, and D, quite easy to keep track of. And she sends her first PTLC message to Bob. What does it contain? It contains Bob's own you know, secret number, B, as well as a PTLC that is locked to Alice's public point corresponding to her secret number, so uppercase A, and um, the addition of that, and uppercase Z, which Alice originally received from Emily. Then, Bob having received this PTLC, he sends a PTLC to Carol, because he knows who the next comp is, 
And that PPLC to Carol is locked to uh, the thing, the, the value that was locked to from Alice, A plus D, plus uppercase B, which Bob is trivially able to calculate by simply taking his own secret number that he received and uh, multiplying it to the generator point. However, uh, how then is uh, Bob able to send a PPLC to Carol? Or how is Carol able to send a PPLC to Dave? So the interesting thing is that uh, the PTLC that Bob sends to Carol in the onion message also contains the secret number that Alice generated for, uh, for, for Carol. So Bob doesn't know it because it's in the onion, but Carol does. And that is where I really struggled with the visualization. So the PTLCs are truly peer to peer, but this thing that is originating from the very beginning, you know, those lowercase b, c, d, and the sum here, those are meant to be in the onion packet that Alice sends. And so those are only ever unwrapped at that first time point. So then Carol sends a PTLC to Dave where she takes the, her incoming PTLC and tweaks it by the uh, elliptic curve point corresponding to the secret that she extracted from, uh, from the onion. And Dave does the same. And then ultimately Emily receives one, but the secret that Emily receives is not some random number that Al Alice generated for her, but it is the sum of all the random numbers that Alice generated. And why does it work? Well, let's work our way backwards. So Emily has received the PTLC that is locked to the sum of all of these uh, elliptic curve points, you know, uppercase A plus B plus C plus D, as well as her own, uh, her own invoice. She is able to unlock it because she obviously knows her own secret, her, her own lowercase c, and she knows the sum of the other points, albeit not any one of them individually. And the reason she knows that sum is because Alice sent it to her in the onion packet. So then when she unlocks it, this is where the PTLC magic is coming in. So the way that the unlocking is supposed to work is it's supposed to reveal to the preceding hop what the secret is going to be. So the preceding hop sees this unlock using A plus B plus C plus D plus D. And then by subtracting their own secret, which Dave still has because it is lowercase b that Dave originally received in the onion packet from Alice, Dave is then, sorry, Dave is then able to subtract lowercase b and using that, unlock the PTLC from Carol. And that propagates all the way to the bottom. Ah, smooth sliding animation. <laughs> <laughs> Where the last step has Alice subtracting uh, her own secret from the thing that was unlocked by Bob, and then she gets lowercase z, which is now our proof of payment, which is really elegant. And you can see that each hop has a completely random PTLC value. Now the magic is, how do we design a system where we are able to extract the secret, where you know the preceding hop, just based on the signature, is able to know, okay, this is how they are able to create a valid signature for the other hop that came before them. And um, this is where adapter signatures come in. So there's always a lot of talk about adapter signatures, but I think, ah, I'll leave it. I, I think it's, uh, it's helpful to just talk a little bit about how precisely they work. So an adapter signature looks almost exactly, no, drop that. It looks exactly like a Schnorr signature, except it is invalid, it is tweaked. As you can see here, we have, you know, if we ignore the thing here, we have exactly the thing that we would expect from a Schnorr signature, but our commitment and the hash is not to our random nonce, but our random nonce plus some tweak t. So what happens is in order to be able to spend it, we need to find out what the tweak is, and then we can fix our little signature. And the tweak, when we learn what it is, the tweak can actually be used to embed a little secret in there. So if the tweak is exactly the secret value that we're looking for, then once there is a valid signature, you can use that to, uh, you know, to calculate the difference between those two signatures and extract the tweak and use the tweak to create a valid signature for, for your preceding hop. So let's think about it a little bit more thoroughly. So let's say Carol wants to send a PTLC to Dave, right? 
and she wants to make sure that uh, they come up with an adapter signature that is initially invalid. Because initially, if we look at this slide, this PDLC, we need an adapter signature for it, which means we need a, some sort of signature that is not correct, but that is going to be correct once the right value comes in. So how precisely, how do we do it? And what is that adapter signature going to look like? So we, we then decide that uh, Carol and Dave do a music two with one another, which is completely unrelated to their channel opening. It's a music two just for this particular PTLC. So Alice generates, well, I mean, Carol generates some random key and some random non-spare. Dave generates some random key and some random non-spare, and they use that pair solely for this particular PTLC. They then, uh, instead of signing it regularly, they commit to a partial signature that is broken and that is tweaked by you know, whatever the PTLC has to be. And here the PTLC has to be A plus B plus C plus Z. So therefore A plus B plus C plus Z is our tweak, which means that then once we find out a valid signature later on, that that tweak is going to be lowercase A plus B plus C plus Z. And guess what uh, Carol needs to know in order to be able to spend Bob's PTLC? She needs to learn what A plus B plus C plus Z is, because then she can subtract her own secret that she received in the onion, and, uh, and that way she can spend Bob's PTLC. So now the question, of course, is, and I think you guys can figure it out, especially with this slide, why are we bothering with this music uh, complication here. Why, why, why do we have to have music just to, to create a, an adapter signature that is tweaked, damaged, broken, whatever terminology you want to use? No, come on. So many ideas. <laughs> That's us. Well, what we We've got time. We've got another... The, the same reasons you don't want the nodes, private key leaks, you don't want the payment point leaked as well if you're not doing the same. Not you know, computations or anything. Like, not, not, just not specific quite. on that payment, not payment in general. Not, not okay. why. I mean, or I guess you know what would happen if it were to be like what 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 scenario are we trying to avoid? A payment being redeemed without it having gone through. Yes. All right. You know what? I'll I'll, I'll just tell you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the important things about this tweak thing is we want to guarantee that if there is a valid signature, it can only be the untweaked signature. We must not have any valid signature for this message that is not exactly using this tweak from this nonce. Which means, because, why is it so important for us? Because if, say, it were to be spent on chain, because you know, I don't know, the channel had to close and, you know, it had to have a unilateral withdrawal, then we need to be able to extract the signature from on-chain and still be able to claim the PTLC that is incoming to us from our preceding pump. And uh, so, we, in order to guarantee that the only way a valid signature is using this particular commitment and this particular tweak, rather, not using this particular tweak or not, not using any tweak at all, is by making sure that neither party can unilaterally create a valid signature. So let's say if instead of using music2, our PTLC basis for the adapter signature were offered by Carol. So Carol just uses her own random public key when she sends a PTLC to Dave. Well, guess what? She doesn't have to wait for any sort of payment to go through. She can just create a different signature because she has the private key already and go on chain with that stuff. And then Dave is, uh, you know, is off in the cold. Similarly, if Dave were to be able to unilaterally uh, dictate which key were to be used for the PTLC, then Dave would be able to, when claiming his own incoming PTLC, do so on chain using a different key in such a way that Carol wouldn't be able to extract the tweak because you know, it, they would be using a different nonce and then Carol is left out in the cold. So that is why we need to make sure that uh, they both pre-agree 
on what the nonces are a priori, such that the only way there can ever be a valid adapter signature or a valid de-adapted adapter signature, untweaked signature, is uh, using the nonce and the public key that they pre-agreed upon, such that the arithmetic always holds. Uh, but once you do that, well, you know, you already know what happens once you do that, but what is the complication? What is the issue with that thing? And the hint is right here. What is the issue with requiring that you have music to, a music to exchange for uh, the whole PTLC stuff. It's an extra round trip. It's an extra round trip. So now, um, an HTLC round trip is one point, well, technically it's 1.5 round trips. Here, it'll become 2.5. So it's uh, because you also have to have the commit and sign and then revoke and act, and you can also combine multiple messages in one TCP message. But um, it's, you know, it's an initial complication. We're gonna have to see whether it significantly delays the uh, you know, slows down multi-hop payments. We are going to have to see whether it uh, adversely uh, affects scalability, but um, we'll find out. Yes. Can you, does, do the nonces need as an input the PTLC point <coughs> transfer, or can you sort of pre-share, like here's the next 10 nonces we need with each other? Well, you can always do pre-sharing, but then with pre-sharing you have to have, you have so, to figure out, okay, how many do you pre-share, how frequently do you pre-share, it's like, uh, and you're still moving the round trips. I, I guess you can do it slightly less frequently, uh, well, but it also depends. Yeah, yeah, it also depends on uh, how frequent your payments are. If you have like a million payments per, per hour, then free sharing isn't gonna be much good. But that is exactly the sort of thing that I think warrants research. The only issue is right now we can't do the research because, uh, you know, I keep, getting pulled back into Swift stuff, so I, I don't even have a simple tapper channel, so it's, it's just not ready. And I sincerely apologize for being here talking about this stuff instead of actually implementing it. Uh, but, uh, here we are. Are there any questions? I'm, I'm sorry it took so long, but because it's been 51 minutes. Uh, but I, I hope it was actually elucidating to some degree. And, uh, so. It just in terms of like you're working on it in L LDK. Yeah. I know that Rose Beef's doing it on these side, like and are there like is every implementation sort of on board and like getting all these things or is it sort of one no. one set of people's going the, out and, yeah. Like the the spec isn't hasn't been merged yet and there are still new comments popping up. And uh, initially we had agreement to um, so one of the things that I was really excited about initially, still am to be quite honest, with the channel opening. If you read the spec, you have all of those different, uh, you know, the, the remote or local non-spare, remote non-spare, partial signature for this, partial signature for that. I was hoping to simplify the messaging a little bit to say, you know, if we have this partial signature, the partial signature only ever contains the remote nonce because that is on, the only situation where it's relevant. So create a new message type that is partial signature with nonce such that the other party would immediately know what it is they're dealing with and as they are processing and verifying the signature, the same blob would already contain the partial nonce that they need to verify the music to aggregation against. And you know, delay it to the point where it's, uh, it's needed, such that you, know, you do uh, everything just in time and you kind of do semantic aggregation so people understand the meaning and have an easier time following the protocol. But uh, there's been some back and forth in that uh, and you know, moving when messages are supposed to be back to the original and then splitting the partial signature nonce back into a partial signature and the nonce where now you have to understand what the, uh, what the hell uh, a remote nonce even means. Like, is it remote for the person sending it or is it remote for the recipient? Like, who's for, it's, um, it, it's a pain to read the, and understand this protocol because music too is kind of annoying. So. If we could make the stipulation that a local nonce is ever going to be used for a signature once, then of course, you know, the, the local nonce would only ever need to be exchanged once because we wouldn't have to worry about signature use. But that is not a stipulation that you can safely make. So there's a ton of back and forth on the, on the spec, and I just hope that one day soon, hopefully Q2, we will have an interrupt for the simple macro channels. Honestly, I don't even know whether it makes sense to work on that first and not on the gossip because as I was just saying earlier, gossip is actually more important. 
But with the gas, if you have this nested stuff and you have to do the aggregation where you are going to have extra round trips, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, maybe, honestly, I should be asking you to not contribute to the spec because like, <laughs> the fewer people are, are, are applying to changes to it, the sooner we are able to get it merged. <laughs> Yeah, just like, you know, just act it, send it. <laughs> yeah, anything else?